naturalist Brianna here at Wood Lake Nature Center and today for our creature feature I wanted to talk with you about one of my favorite snakes that can be found here in Minnesota. And before I actually tell you what kind of species of snake it is, I wanted to go over some really um, great features about the snake and see if you can guess what type of species it is. So this snake here, you might not be able to tell as it's curled up in my hands, but it can grow to be about six feet long, which is by far one of the longest snake in Minnesota and one of the longest snakes found in North America. It also has one of the loudest hisses in North America as well. And that hiss or that kind of snorting noise that it makes, it reminds people of a bull, which is what gives it its nickname, bull snake. So, if you think you know what type of species of snake this is, and if you're thinking to yourself, gopher snake, you have guessed correctly. Gopher snakes get their name because of one of their favorite things they like to eat, which are gophers. And gophers are found in Minnesota prairies, and because there's only about 1% of Minnesota's prairies left, the habitat and food port food source for this snake has greatly diminished, which has caused it to be one of Minnesota's species of concerns. And so there's actually been a lot of um, efforts to reintroduce this um, bull snake or gopher snake back into Minnesota prairies, which is pretty awesome. They've been out there inserting microchips into the bull snakes and releasing them, and they're able to track that their population is in fact coming back. And some of you might think, why would we want such a large snake like this here in Minnesota? But they actually are great for keeping um, rodent populations under control. They don't just eat gopher snakes, but other mice, field mice, frogs, things like that. So they're great to have on your field if you are a farmer. Um, this snake here is also known as a gentle giant. Even in the wild, the last thing they're gonna wanna do is strike at you. Oftentimes people confuse the snake for the timber rattlesnake. And a few different ways you can tell the difference is one, rattlesnakes are pit vipers. So they're gonna have a larger, more triangular head and a skinnier neck. And our gopher snakes here have a thicker neck and a smaller head. Now, you probably don't wanna get that close to a snake to try to identify it by its face. But another obvious way here is to look at its tail. And his tail here, he's kind of curled around me, holding on for support, um, has those dark bands on it, but there is no rattle on this tail. So that's also a dead giveaway that it's not a rattlesnake. Now, rattlesnakes are venomous, so they eat their prey by um, biting them and injecting venom into the body with their teeth. And um, this snake here is a constrictor, um, so great at giving hugs. Um, how it catches its prey is it will kind of pounce on it and grab it with its mouth and then quickly coil around it or wrap its body around it in a knot to squeeze it. Um, as it's squeezing its prey, the prey will breathe out and it'll slowly squeeze in more and more, um, causing it to suffocate. But recent research shows that snakes actually cause most of their prey to have a heart attack before they even suffocate which is actually a much quicker and easier way for their prey to die. Um, some of you might think, how could a snake this size, even though it is a large snake, possibly eat a gopher, which is much larger than the snake's head? Now, snakes have pretty amazing superpowers to be able to swallow their food whole because they don't have the correct teeth for chewing. Their teeth are more backward facing. And how a gopher snake eats its food is it actually, once it has grabbed hold of its prey and the prey is killed, it will start eating it from the face for first, I should say, or forward. Um, and they can do something pretty amazing with their jaw. Many of you have probably heard that snakes can unhinge their jaw, and that actually isn't the case. The snakes actually have just really flexible jaw because it's not fused together like our jaws are, our mammals' jaws are. So the snake in the front, their lower jaw here, their mandible and upper jaw, actually isn't fused, and so they can come apart or separate. And as it's swallowing its food or working it down its throat, it can actually use it kind of like a conveyor belt because you can see snakes don't have any arms or legs to kind of help 
push that food down, which is pretty amazing. Now for us, if we try to eat something the same, similar size as a gopher to a gopher snake, it'd be like us trying to swallow a, a volleyball hole. And we'd also probably suffocate and choke. Um, the cool thing that snakes have is their breathing tube where their glottis is actually not located in the back of their throat like ours, but at the bottom of their mouth. And that glottis kind of acts as a tube as they're eating. It can slowly extend out of its mouth and kind of hang out of its mouth like a snorkel. Pretty amazing. The more I learn about snakes, the more fascinated I am and the more I think they're beautiful creatures. Um, some ways to identify the snake as well is that gopher snakes are kind of that yellow straw color and along their face they oftentimes have kind of a black stripe or eye stripe. They also kind of start out dark towards the head, get a little lighter in the middle of the body, and then end with those dark bands or stripes on its tail. So they definitely have this um, black blotches, brown, it's brown to black blotches with um, that yellow straw color in between and underneath. Now as snakes continue to eat, they continue to grow and they're going to need to shed their skin so that they can get um, healthier scales underneath. And one way that they do this is maybe every three, four um, months they'll kind of shed their skin all at once, which is pretty crazy to think about. Us humans, we slowly shed our skin um, every single day. We don't even realize it, and that's kind of what some of that dust is in our house. But for these snakes, they'll find maybe a sharp rock or an object that they'll rub their nose up against. And as they um, rub against that sharp object, it's going to kind of split that skin, and they're going to crawl through it or crawl out of it, kind of like how you take your sock off um, inside out. So here we have some old snake skin or shed from one of our bull snakes. Um, it kind of just feels like plastic, looks like plastic, and sounds a lot like plastic. Hi everyone, my name is Rachel. I'm one of the naturalists here at Woodlake Nature Center. We just saw Bree talk about our bull snakes. Uh, and to go with that, we're actually gonna be reading a story called Birdie by Janelle Cannon. You can tell it's also about snakes. On a small tropical island, the sun rose high above the steamy jungle. A mother python was sending her hatchlings out into the forest the way all mother pythons do. Grow up hot, big and green, as green as the trees, she called to her little yellow babies as they happily scattered among the trees. But Birdie dawdled. He was proudly eyeing his bright yellow skin. He especially liked the bold stripes that zigzagged down his back. Why hurry to grow, we grow up big and green, he wondered. Maybe some of the older snakes could tell him. Birdie ventured into the treetops to look for them. Why do you think Birdie should be green rather than bright yellow? Umbles, Aggie, and Ribbon were lazing about on some branches nearby. Verdi peered at their droopy green bodies. It's not polite to stare, chatted Aggie. Umbles burped and groaned. It's taken nearly four weeks for that last lizard to digest. I surely do like lizards, but lizards do not like me. Why don't lizards like you? asked Bertie. Don't interrupt, Umbles grumbled. Dear me, whined Aggie, if I don't shed soon, this itchy skin will drive me bananas. Bertie tapped a tune with his tail as he waited to speak. Stop that, Bertie. It makes me nervous, Ribbon complained. Besides, you'll never grow up to be properly green, always interrupting and constantly fidgeting. Bertie couldn't imagine being in such a hurry to be like them. And he really didn't w wanted to keep his sporty stripes. Hoping to find snakes that weren't so boring, Bertie slipped away. Dozer was snoring in a tree not far from the others. Hello, 
said Birdie. Do you want to climb trees with me? I'm tired, Dozer growled. Go and do a few laps around the jungle, okay? Birdie's heart sank. Greens were not only lazy and boring, they were rude. At the top of a very tall tree, Birdie gripped one branch with his tail and another with his little snake jaws. I will never be lazy, boring, or green, he thought. I will jump and climb and keep moving so fast that I will stay yellow and striped forever. And then Verdi let go. <gasps> Whoa! He's floor he's just flying through the air. I don't think snakes generally do that. Go Verdi. From a distance, the greens watched. Oh my! They chorused. Ribbon shook his head. At this rate, he'll be lucky to make it to his first molt. Aggie nodded. He's likely to put an eye out on that on a branch. Umbles moaned. He may not live to turn green. Whew. But one day, Verdi's skin began to peel revealing a pale green stripe stretching along his whole body. Ah! He gasped. How can this be? I'm the speediest snake in the jungle and I'm still turning green. He raced down to the river, get, grabbing a mouthful of rough leaves. What do you think he's gonna do with those leaves? Verdi flung himself into the water. If I can't Rub this green off, I'll scrub it off, he thought. Oh, he's trying to scrub it off with the leaves. His frantic splashing caught the eye of a large bottom feeder, bruising the murky depths. Mmm, the old fish hummed. Lunch. <gasps> oh no. Before the old fish could haul Verdi under, the frightened snake bit him on the nose. Ow! Ah, uh, poo! With a blast of his rubbery lips, the great fish sneezed, sending Verdi into the air. Slapping the soggy shore, Verdi skidded out of reach. Well, that's lucky. Close, he sputtered. Every inch of his body was covered with wet, gloopy mud. Hmm, kind of lumpy, kind of brown. It sure beats being green. He left the mud on. But the soft brown muck dried into a hard gray shell and Verdi could barely move. If he even budged, the stuff cracked off in jagged chunks. As each piece fell away, Bertie could see that his body was even greener than before. This is terrible, cried Bertie. He pictured himself hanging around in droopy loops, itching and complaining and worrying all day like the old greens. He looked up into the sky where the sun blazed a beautiful yellow just the yuck color he used to be. Then he pulled a vine to the top of a tree, launching himself from the treetop. Verdi startled a flock of colorful birds. He became dizzy with delight. Sure, the bright sun and his lofty speed would turn him golden again. In his joy, Verdi forgot that he would fall back down to earth. Whippity whappity, flip flap, wham! Plummeting through the trees, Verdi landed in a cro crooked sprawl across a log in the forest floor. He couldn't move. Help! 
he croaks. Oh no. As usual, the greens had been watching Verdi's antics. They moved quickly to grab where he lay. Didn't we say it would come to this? Umble said, shaking his head. Aggie sighed. Lucky thing, he's still got two good eyes. They gently lifted Verdi up to a safer place where they could watch over him while he healed. Neatly splinted to a branch, Verdi had no choice but to listen to the greens as they gabbed. Remember how I used to streak across the forest floor? Riddens asked. Quick as lightning, answered Aggie, and I climbed giant trees like they were nothing. They grew taller then, you know. The thing I dared to run down and swallow Umbles bragged, wild boar were no match for me. Verdi was astonished. You used to run and climb and hunt giant pigs? What happened? Ribbon crashed, just like you, Aggie replied. I took a terrible fall and almost put an eye out. Then old Umbles here nearly choked. Uh, shine and a an occasional good meal. Nearly choked to death. Now we all prefer the quiet life. A warm perch, a little sunshine, and an occasional good meal. Sounds pretty tasty. The greens rambled on about their days of glory and Verdi settled in on his branch. Finally, one afternoon, Umble said, it looks like you are ready to go again. He carefully untied Verdi from the branch. You are welcome to come with us, said Aggie. Ribbon agreed. The three greens slipped quietly back into the forest. Verdi wasn't ready to join them. He wasn't sure where he wanted to go, so he just stretched and stayed put until the sun went down. He listened to the forest come alive. It's amazing the things that you can hear or see when you take the time to look. Time passed. The sun and moon took turns in the sky. Verdi marveled at the full as the full moon grew thinner every night. Then he watched patiently as it slowly grew round again. He wondered why he hadn't noticed that before. Verdi became so green that he blended in perfectly with the leaves. He was still so, he was so still that the other creatures walked right by without seeing him. One fine morning as Verdi basked in the sunshine, two small yellow snakes approached. They tapped and fitted it as they stared. Get a load of that old green guy, one of them whispered. Do you ever think he moves? The other snickered. I seriously doubt it. They just, they're just like how I used to be, thought Verdi. And now I'm what I was afraid to be. He looked at this big, his big green body and slowly smiled. How would you like to climb trees with me? He asked. With you? The yellows were astonished. I'll even show you my fancy figure eight, Verdi replied, though he was a little worried about putting his eye out. With practice, the three snakes performed a perfect triple figure eight. Leaping and looping with his little striped friends, Verdi laughed. I may be big and very green, but I'm still me. The end.